Okay, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? It's nice to see you all this morning. Wait for a few people to enter the room and then we can get started with our live today. It's nice to, for me to introduce uh, Tiemek, who's here with us from, uh, also from the dive center, actually. Yes, I just flew the way up to UK, although there is no flight. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, otherwise people send you messages asking why you're not staying home. <laughs> <laughs> Are we, are sure we are online because I, I have the, your fan page on and I don't see it. Yeah, it says it's live on my one. Okay, maybe it's first to delay. Eight people already joined in, according to it. Good morning, eight people. <laughs> Nine now, let's try again. Okay, good. So I can see the live now. Morning, Sam. Good morning, Rob. Dave, how are we doing? Uh, Side Matt James, Stuart Acklam. Hi, how are you doing, buddy? You should be in the garden, apparently. So uh, I won't tell your wife. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. So we've got a few people entering the room now. Yeah, also not, not easy. The good idea was to wait like five even sometimes 10 minutes because people are always late, preparing yeah. the time now and so on. Huh? We'll wait for people to catch up and join in. But a uh, nice looking Revo there with a nice black cover. I noticed that's a the special edition version. Yeah. I have either one as well to show. So I will, I will show both units actually because, I, because I, have, I have a micro and a mini here. So not only the black one. Do you see the unit? Clearly, Adam? Yeah, I can see the unit really clearly. It looks, looks fantastic. Okay, good. Uh, here comes Mark Crane. Paolo from Portugal. Ludo from uh, Mauritius. In Nipun, I think, from Thailand. So, uh, Mata from Italy and Simon from the UK. So a few people joining us now. It's nice to see you all. In the next kind of two or three minutes we'll get started. Um, it's an interesting one today because I won't be hosting it. I'll just be asking a few questions and it'll be hosted by uh, our friend here, Chemek from Poland. Um, but he looks a lot like he's in the dive center with his background. Uh, the idea is, is uh, to go through in the same way we went through the other rebreathers to talk about the Revo. So at that time, I'll turn my camera off, but I'll be in the background. Still, please feel free to ask as many questions as you like. Um, just write them in the comments. Uh, we'll get to them as and when it's appropriate. So we'll, we'll stop the video, we'll stop doing the build up at some point and uh, jump into questions and then we'll carry on. Um, the Revo is a really nice rebreather. I am, I am a diver of the Revo, but not an instructor, which is why it makes sense that uh, the Chemek comes to you and, and gives you the full rundown and can answer all of your questions. So we've got 25 people in the room now. So I think it makes a good time to, to start. So, uh, Chemek, I'm going to switch my camera off now and you can uh, introduce yourself to the guys and show them uh, this, this awesome rebreather. Sure. So, hello, everybody. Thank you, Adam, for inviting me to do this presentation for you. Uh, my name is Przemysław Petszak, but because nobody can pronounce it, you can try to, to pronounce the shorter version, which is Przemek, you, and then the easiest one is PK. So, I'm a SSI International Training Director I mainly focus on rebreathers. Uh, I mostly dive the Revo. That's why Adam probably invited me to do the presentation for it because I probably know the unit well. I'm from Poland and currently uh, in Poland, I work for SSI. I'm a SSI uh, representative for Poland. And at the same time, I do all the training stuff for SSI, XR, rebreathers, and so on. I'm also uh, an Horizon trainer. I was I had the privilege to be a part of the Horizon development team, both for the materials and the unit itself. Uh, so basically, my life goes around with this 
for the prison not to find out. So today we are about the revo. So uh, the, the objective of this presentation is to, to show you the revo, explain the revo, show you the pros and cons of the unit. So I'm I'm gonna try. I will try to do it the same way as Adam did before. So I will explain you the unit. I will show you its advantages. I will show you how to build it up. I will show you how to prepare the unit for diving. And doing it, I will point this nice features of the units I think are worth worth to mention. So let's start then. Uh, in the beginning, the Revo is uh, manufactured in Belgium. Uh, it's, it was designed by Paul Roy, Paul Roy Makers uh, in Belgium. This is the hybrid CCR, we call it. Probably most of you already figured out that we have uh, two kinds of CCRs. ECCRs and MCCRs, basically the, the difference is about how they provide the oxygen into the diver. And usually the ECCRs that are only elect electronically controlled by the computer, the solenoid and the manual are not. They have a constant flow of the oxygen and then the diver has to maintain the PO2 manually. The Revo has a little bit of both. I'm gonna explain you a little more, more about this later on, but we have uh, both, uh, let's say, uh, both uh, parameters, both options on, on, on the Revo HCCR. We have the solenoid that is electronically controlled, and we have also the constant mass flow and, of course, the manual injection. So I'm going to start with the sizes, because those of you who are who are looking on the website, maybe your was interested, interested about the river. Probably you found the information that there are three sizes of the unit. We have micro, mini, and the standard. And uh, the sizes are all about how well they fit your body. So the micro is the smallest one, mini is the middle one, and the standard is the, 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 the tallest one, the highest one. You can see the dimensions on the river websites. But what is important for you to understand that every three, all three units, they have exactly the same parameters. They have the same scrubbers. They, they, they may have the same tanks installed. They have the same duration of the dives. The only difference is the housing size and the counter lungs volume. Actually, the counter lungs volume is, is the same. I mean, the counter lung inside is the same. It's just the housing is smaller. So the counter lung can expand less. So that's why the, the, the practical volume is, is less. Uh, although the micro has a 5.5 uh, liters of the volume, the counterlines, to be honest, I never met a person who needed more for diving, even if they need to breathe very heavily. So actually, the only one practical difference between those two sizes, micro, mini, and standard, is basically the size. And about the size is very simple. So, why would we want to have a big and heavier unit if we can use a smaller one? Uh, there's no reason. If you can dive with the river micro, there's probably no reason, the micro, the smallest one, there's probably no reason to, to buy a bigger one. There, they might be two. Uh, the first one is simply reaching the valves because the river to have the best breathing performance needs to be uh, uh, installed as high as possible on your back. So if the unit is as high as, as possible on your back, obviously the valves are also a little bit high. So if somebody is very tall person, like I don't know, 190 or two meters high, then maybe he will have a problem to reach the valves when the unit is very high on his back. Valves are on the bottom, of course, of the units. The tanks are, uh, the valves, uh, the tank valves are on the bottom. So if you install the unit high enough or properly high, then if you are a virtual person, especially with some movement restrictions of your arms, you may have a problem to reach the valves. That's why you may have slightly higher unit, like mini or even standard, uh, so you can reach the valves easily. The, the second reason that you might want to have uh, something bigger than micro is the weight. Uh, I will talk about the weight, uh, the weight of the river also a little bit more in the, in the next part of the presentation. But what now is important to, to know that uh, the Revo can also be made of two 
uh, type of, of materials, the titanium or steel. The titanium is lighter, it's roughly two kilo less uh, than, than stainless steel. So if you're diving in the cold water with a thick undergarment, uh, if you are using steel, uh, then you may need a less weight because the unit itself is the same, the same dimensions, is the same, the same um, the same the same size, but it's just slightly heavier. I will tell you a little bit later on about the weight on the river. River is really nice uh, unit because you don't need much weight uh, with it. So this two kilo of the of the housing difference sometimes is just a difference. Do I have to carry any weights, or I don't have to carry them at all? So if you're diving in the cold water, you might consider a stainless steel unit and the micro, the smallest one, is only titanium. You cannot buy the stainless steel micro. So again, if you can dive with the micro with your full configuration, you have reasonable, reasonable amount of weights. I would highly recommend that, that unit. If you need too much weight with the micro in your environment, with your configuration, your dry suit, wet suit, whatever you're using, then you may consider, for example, the mini and then also the steel version because it will be slightly heavier, so you don't need to put that much weight weights on the unit. And the standards is, is not many people actually are using standards. I was using ones in the very My first rebel was actually the standard one. I like that. Uh, but it's much heavier and, and, and much bigger on your on your back. So if you don't need that that high, that unit, I don't see any reason uh, to use it. So the sizes are all about how the unit fits your body. There is no any difference. It's not like you cannot dive. You can dive deeper or you can dive longer or whatever with a bigger unit compared to the smaller smallest one. They have the same scrubbers. The same tank can be installed. And so everything else is essentially just the housing is just about how they fit, how they fit your body. So this is so about this I is the this yeah. sorry this is the this is the Revo three right? Yeah, is the Revo one and two available in in the same materials or just no, 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 I'm I'm only talking about the Revo that is right now on the market in, in regular style because Revo one and two are of course not uh, not anymore available. Maybe the second hand unit. So the Revo two was the size of the standard. Uh, the the micro came with the Revo three. So, so that's, this is about this, uh, the sizes and River One. To be honest, I don't even remember because I was not even diving the River when there was River One. I don't think that there was some more than a few units actually on the market. It was just testing, or Paul was just testing those units, I, I, I believe. So, so yeah, I'm talking about the River Three, the, the one that is right now, and actually the only one with the CE certification. So uh, because of we cannot really, we should not buy the units without the CE certification. This is the one that we are considering. Okay. So uh, let's move on then. Uh, so this is about the sizes. Uh, then, it, as I already told you, we can put any tanks on the river. I mean, any tanks that will fit. Uh, so two liter tanks, two liter tanks, uh, all the type of river tanks will fit. Rivo has a really nice feature for installing the tanks. We call this the tank fixation. I will just now show you how easy it is to put the tank on and off. So now I just took the uh, oxygen tank off. You can see that there is a, a steel or titanium part with four pins. Those pins slide in into the housing and there's a, there a locking pin that locks the tank on the unit so that the tank doesn't come off. And then you just use uh, steel cam bands to uh, connect those those uh, tanks fixation to the tank. So whatever you're using is two liter, or you can use just two liter tank. You do it exactly the same way. Since two years, I think we have also what we call the travel uh, tank fixation, which basically works on the same principle. We have this four pins and the locking uh, no locking system. So I just slide it in. And then I can use that st standard uh, tank buckle to put it on the unit. So it's, it's a little bit more convenient when you travel because you don't have to take the tanks with you. You can rent the tanks on the side if, if they do rent the tanks and you just take your travel, travel logs with you and then, uh, and then it works very simply, very fast. 
Uh, it's just a um, little bit more work to take the time off you know, because you have to do and undo this, this buckle every time. Or actually, you can also, the same way, take this whole uh, tank fixation off. Once you, when, when you have your own tanks, usually people are using the standard time fixation because uh, uh, on the Revo, it's quite important for, uh, uh, quite important to ally the tank correctly here, because if you do it in the wrong orientation, then it will be a little bit confusing here and you will not be able to turn on the first stage, put it on the, on the uh, connected to the valve or the tank will be too much out. Uh, outside the unit. So it's a little bit uh, um, work in the beginning to align those tanks uh, uh, correctly. But once you do it, they are fixed and they are always correct. So you don't have to worry about that. And you can very easily and very fast uh, put the tanks on and off the unit, which with this travel quad a lot is a little bit more, uh, more work. With this uh, fixed tank fixation, it's simply like this. You slide it in. And it stays there, so it's really nice. So you can put here any rebuilder tanks. You can put three liter tanks. You can put two liter tanks. There are also two liters uh, thicker tanks available in Revo that are slightly smaller, so they end up like here more or less. But then they are a little bit more in the diameter. So any tanks uh, for the rebuilder will fit um, will fit the the Revo. So. Uh, the main difference, what differs the Revo the most from other units is actually the design. So the Paul, the designer, when he was, when he was designing the Revo, he was thinking completely out of the box. What I like to say is when you, when you look on every Revo on the market, uh, that, that they have a lot of similar, similarities. They have counter lines, they have uh, the head, they have the scrubber canister. They have breathing hoses, they have key connectors, and they have DSVs or BOVs. So I'll, I'm using this uh, simplification or actually the, 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 the example that if you take five units and you just disassemble them and you put all the parts into one big box and imagine that all the threads and all the connections fit together. So there's one thread for every key connector, one thread for every building hoses and there's one thread for every canister and so on. You could actually build the unit using the counter lines from JJ, the head from AP, the housing from uh, JJ again, then the second counter line from, I don't know, Poseidon. Uh, then you can take uh, the DSV from AP and, and you will build the unit because they all have exactly the same design. Like if you, if, if you create the scheme of the rebreather, you will have all the same parts more or less in the same place. They, of course, differ uh, each other uh, with the materials they are designed, with uh, electronics that is used, with, uh, uh, with the size of, of the scrubbers. But in general, they are more or less the same. We have the counter lungs, uh, we have the, the DSV or BOV, then there's a hose, exhale in has going into the key piece or key connector that are connected to the counter lines that are that are somewhere on your shoulders or on your back then the second hose goes to the scrubber canister then the gas is passing through the scrubber and after the scrubber we have our electronics or our head or our emoji whatever you call it where all the magic happens which is the sensor analysis the oxygen injections and so on and so on so this is very similar to every other unit but Revo, because Revo has completely different design. We don't have such a thing like head or electronics on Revo in one place. It's, it's not like you can just find this, this most expensive part of the rebreather, which is the head, and just remove it, and then you have sensors, solenoid, and all the electronics. There's no such things. It's all divided into several parts of the rebreather. Uh, the second thing is that Everything is closed in this titanium or, or, or stainless steel housing. So everything is in, inside there. All the counter lines, which is a huge advantage. There is no counter lines outside. What you see here is just a wing. There's no counter lines completely available from the outside, which is a good protection from, and from the damage. You can actually see, if you take a close look here, uh, you can see actually the bladder 
uh, inside. That's the, that's the action they can't analyze. So they are completely closed in those in this housing. Uh, also, the other difference, which, which you will notice probably very very fast, that we have only one inhale and exhale hose. We don't have this standard connection like every other rebreather does. I mean, every let's say 95%, I don't know every rebreather out there, but most of them. So we don't have a, let's say, inhale or exhale hose, then the key connector, the counter lines, and another hose. We have only one hose that is connected direct, directly to the housing, which is connecting that hose directly to the counter lines. That solution gives us, gives us incredible freedom of movement under the water. The first impression and the most common impression that people have when they try the Revo after diving other units is a uh, freedom of movement. Depends on the unit. Uh, usually when you put this unit on your back, it also depends if it's front mountain counter lines, back mountain counter lines, or whatever. Then the, those units dif differ in the how free you are under the water, but it's never as free as open circuit. I'm, as, I'm sure everybody for diving and we would, they would admit that. Uh, and on the Revo, it is really, really nice uh, from this perspective because we have only one hose, which is actually very nice silicon hose. So there is no TPs that are actually uh, restricting our movement or limiting our movement. Uh, there is no counter lines outside that are uh, that makes us more bulky here. So basically, this is very, very uh, comfortable unit to dive in terms of. of of, of the movement and for example if you want to turn your head left or right there's completely no problem you don't even feel that something is resisting your, your movement so if you want to take a look on your body on the left on the, on, or on the right side there's many units especially the one with the front motor countenance when you have to move all your body to to see anything around it's not the case with the river so this is really nice uh, feature this is really nice the way it was designed uh, so the movement under the water is very, 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 very nice. In the front, we have uh, we have our wing. This is actually the Miles wing. I, I put it. This is my personal unit, so it's a little bit, little bit modificated, but only just to have fun and play with other uh, other parts. I was wondering how the Miles leather will work out with with, with the Revo. Uh, to be honest, I uh, I didn't notice any difference between this one and the. And the standard river wing, uh, and also the harness. Uh, I put here a standard webbing harness, just with the one, uh, just with the one uh, uh, hook here to, to make it easier to, to take off. Uh, usually, the river uh, from the factory comes with a uh, adjustable harness. I'm gonna show you this harness in a minute on on other unit. Uh, but if you think about now, uh, this is really comfortable in the front because here we have only the harness we don't we have nothing else this is my my side wing bungee so you don't have to worry about that so once you put your unit on the only thing you have in the front is actually your wing inflator and your manual edition and mav i will explain you a little bit more about this later on so this is very comfortable unit to dive because of of the design we don't have anything in the front just like we're diving twin set. There's only the harness, there is a, uh, the wind inflator, and there is one additional device to manually inject uh, the gases. Also the pressure gauges, you can nicely route them along the, the, the harness, so they are not dangling down, that you have easy access for them. So you can really, you can make a really unique, nice streamlined and, and clean uh, in, the, in, the, in the front. So uh, the next difference, because I'm going to tell you the, the, the major difference between the Revo and the other units, and then I'm going to, I will go to the details. Then the second difference is uh, the design of the gas pathway, let's, let's call it. Because if you think about how the gas is traveling in, in the rebreather, so from the exhale into the inhale hose, on the Revo, everything is 90 degrees angle which means the gas is not traveling from the bottom to the top. It's, it's, the gas is actually traveling, uh, point is nice. the gas is actually traveling like from here to here, down and here. So this is 
the, this is a different, but what, what that gave us, what, what was the advantage of this solution is actually uh, the size of the unit. Look, if you look on the side of the unit, so the diameter here, so from, from, from the highest point on your back, to the diver's body is, is 180 millimeters, which is basically the twin set size. So the unit the, the unit is really nice because it's not much far away from your body, so which especially the cave divers or the wreck penetration divers um, uh, uh, like that solution because the unit is actually not so tall. So this is this is the thing. The next thing is the scrubber design. And this is probably the biggest difference because if I show you the scrubber on the Revo, it will be completely different than every other rebreather out there. So Revo has a two scrubbers. So the design of the Revo is that it has it's a dual scrubber rebreather and those two scrubbers, they're, they're installed in series, which means the gas is traveling first to the first scrubber then it's going to the second scrubber. So it's just like a one scrubber, but it's cut by half. Actually, if you look on the scrubbers, they look exactly like this. If you connect them together, you, you will have pretty much similar thing that you already know from the previous uh, videos of Adam, like a AP scrubber or Poseidon scrubber or JJ scrubber. Actually, the, 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 the size would be almost identical because each of the Revo scrubber has 1.35 kilos of the line in it. But the advantage of it is, is, uh, is much more than the size. So here inside the unit, we have two scrubbers. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to explain you the unit using the gas pathway. So I'm going to explain you part by part of the rebreather from the moment when the diver is exhaling to the moment when the gas makes a full circle and comes back to the diver's mouth. And then I can show you all the features and all the parts uh, that uh, the gas was traveling through. So of course we start with our mouthpiece. So we have a, we have a DSV live, uh, on, the, on, on the Revo. Now there is options to also have a BOV on the Revo. It's actually the Horizon BOV that was adapted to Revo, uh, but this is a relatively new thing. So it's there's a simple, simple working principle. Up the loop is open, we're breathing from the rebreather. Down the loop is closed, we are breathing from the rebreather. By the default, we have the gag strap on the Revo. This is a really nice feature, which many divers don't like. But uh, what I like to say that the people who are not using the gag strap are just because they, they didn't get used to it. It's just like a snorkel. In the beginning, when the open water divers start to dive, the snorkel is only disturbing thing. They always try to find the inflator, they keep the snorkel, or they want to find the snorkel, they, they keep the inflator, they don't like it. But it just takes time to get used to it. And once you get used to the snorkel, it's very useful and nice tool to have. It's exactly the same with the, with the gag strap. Once you get used to it and you, you build yourself a muscle memory of, of using it, this is a really great thing. First, first, it helps you to keep the DSV in your mouth. So in the long dives, you don't feel that much of, of the fatigue on your jaw or on your mouth uh, while, while holding the DSV in your mouth. But what's more important is, that, of course, the safety. Uh, I know Few stories I cannot tell you in public when the gag strap actually saved people life. And I, I, unfortunately, I know at least two when not having a gag strap on didn't save the life. So this is really, really actually nice feature to have. I know that there's some other units that also have this as an option. I highly recommend to use it. If you try it and you didn't like it on even on other units, Believe me, you have to just get used to it. Once you get used to it, it's very brilliant, very comfortable to use. Okay, so the diver inhales. The river actually, the gas is traveling from the right side to the left. So pretty much the opposite than most of the units. So this is the, our inhale hose. The diver inhales, takes the, um, takes the oxygen, produces the CO2, and then the gas goes to the exhalation hose. Here to our exhalation, exhalation cantalize. 
So now it's really difficult to show you this in the camera. So you have to use a little bit of your imagination. But if the gas enters, maybe I will take the tank off. It will be much better. Okay, so once the gas enters here, the cantilines, it is exactly coming here. Now, what I just did, I just put my hand inside the cantilines. I can actually touch my exhalation of holes right now from the inside. So here, what you can see is actually the inside of your counter line, of your exhale counter line. So this is why the open uh, uh, exhale counter line, which gives us a really nice uh, feature because we can very easily dry the counter lines inside. What you see now is inside the counter line. So after the dive, you just simply leave it open like this. If, if, that's, if this is the boat on the wind, sorry, if this is the boat with the wind, without too much waves or splashes, you can leave it like this and after 10 minutes, everything is completely dry inside. So in the exhale counter line, we have, we call it solenoid tray. And the solenoid tray is the, is, is the place where all the gas management has place. So what we have here, we have here the solenoid, we have here the ADV, and we have here our sensor board. The sensor board is the first computer in the Revo. Remember, I told you that in the Revo, the electronics is spread around all the unit. So this is one part of the electronics. This, this, this small black rectangle is at the, actually one of the electronics. There is a circuit board inside. It's connected to the solenoid. And this one is actually responsible for firing the solenoid if, if it's needed. Here, if there is a connection with a wet metal connector, this is the digital connection, the, the CAN bus, the same that is used uh, in JJ, in SF2, I believe, as well. Uh, so this is a digital communication where all the data is traveling from our sensor board to other computers, which I will explain in a minute. What we have here as well is our constant mass flow. So I pointed you this, this part as a solenoid, but actually what it is, it is a solenoid and the orifice in one device. So the orifice is actually built in the solenoid. So if the solenoid is firing, the oxygen uh, comes from that hole and the CMF constant mass flow or the orifice is injecting the oxygen or, or leaking the oxygen constantly from, from, from that hole. So here we constantly have a little bit of the oxygen leaked in through the constant flow. And then there is a solenoid that fires if our fascia pressure drops below the set point. I will get into that solution a little bit more in the detail when, once I finish uh, explaining all the unit. So here, all the gas management happens. So once we inject the oxygen, if, if it was necessary, maybe we inject some diluent through the ADV if that was necessary, then the gas, is traveling to the first scrubber, okay? So the gas is going like from the bottom to the, to the top of the scrubber. So here actually the gas is coming out from the scrubber uh, and if everything was well, everything was fine, we are using correct scrubber rotation system, which I'll explain to you. And if we are using correct scrubber duration times, all the CO2 is removed in the first scrubber. The second one is a safety margin. So if everything works well, all the CO2 should be removed here. So if you are paying attention on Adam's video, you, you probably noticed the fact that on every rebreather, there was, there was always an O-ring that was actually sealing the scrubber. So the gas with the CO2 is not traveling around the scrubber. So it will bypass it and no CO2 will be removed. There is no such an O-ring here on the river. So this uh, in the beginning looks a bit confusing because we all know that these O-rings are very critical in every units because if that O-ring is damaged or you forget to put it in. 
uh, you may have the seal to break through because the gas will just simply travel around the scrubber instead of through the scrubber and the seal will be not removed. It turns out that there's completely no need for that orange and this is for two reasons. Remember that the gas will always choose the easiest way to pass through. So because the scrubber has a very low profile, it's simply that's that small compared to let's say other units scrubbers that are mostly twice higher. Of course, the scrubber material creates the resistance to flow. So if we don't seal that surface in other units, the gas will have the easier pathway to go around it instead of through the scrubber, uh, scrubber, uh, scrubber materials. Turns out that if the scrubber is that high, the resistance of the flow to that scrubber is actually lower than around the scrubber. Also, there's a special shape of that side of the scrubber that creates resistance. And then the last thing, once we start breathing, we create the humidity. And the humidity is collecting is collected here around the scrubber or here around the scrubber that simply works again as a seeding uh, solution. So this being said, there is no scrubber o-ring on the river. And even without it, there is no seal to break through which was tested on the sea conditions and proven that it works, which is really nice because there's one o-ring less, one crucial or critical or increase on the river, which makes the unit a bit safer. So the gas was passing through the, the, the first scrubber, we call it a top scrubber because it's on the top of the unit. And now the gas with the CO2 removed is traveling along the cover. You can see that here we have, have the passage. So the gas is traveling exactly yeah, that's it, exactly here. So now this gas is traveling here to get to the second scrubber. What is happening uh, here, the gas is getting into the turbulences. So it's actually mixing even better. So if there was the oxygen <clears throat> injected in uh, before the first scrubber, uh, it now is correctly mixed. And also if there was any slightly amount of the CO2 that passed through the first cover. Now this gas will be nicely mixed before it gets to the second one, which means the CO2 will be distributed. This, this leftovers, small amount of the CO2 will be distributed equally on all the surface of the second scrubber. So it will be immediately removed if, if, if any. So now, we are closing this cover like this. We have here two O-rings on each uh, scrubber compartment to simply seal it. And also this scrubber cover is uh, playing a role of the thermal, thermal protection. Also that closes, seals, and, and allows the gas to pass through and go to the second scrubber. On the second scrubber, as I said before, if everything was fine, should, if no CO2 should be present. So this is just our safety margin. So the gas is just passing through. And then after the scrubber, we have our sensor tray. Our sensor tray is simply uh, the plastic tray with five oxygen sensors. I'm gonna explain why five when we discuss electronics, but the Revo can have up to five oxygen sensors. So here, the gas that is already CO2 removed, the gas that is oxygen, that has oxygen injected in it is analyzed. So actually what we see on our electronics is after injection, after removing CO2. So we see exactly the gas that will be inhaled in a minute, because here, what you can see actually is an inside of inhaled tanker line. If you look on the side of the unit, the counter lines are laying down <laughs> like this, one on top of each, of each other. Here is our exhale counter line, and here is our inhale, and they are connected here, so the gas can only go, uh, can only travel from one counter line to the other, passing the scrubber. So what is actually important for you to notice, which is a big advantage of Revo design, the diameter 
of, of the hole, let's call it, through which the gas has to pass or travel between the, 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 the scrubber and the counter lines. So normally those diameter is the key connector diameter or the, or the breathing hose has diameter, which is much less than this one, which creates a more breathing resistance. So Revo, because it has a back-mounted counter line and they are completely back-mounted, because what it's worth to mention is if we talk about the JJ, for example, or AP with back-mounted counter lines, there are, we call them back-mounted counter lines, but they're not exactly fully back-mounted because they are slightly here on the shoulders, right? And then they go all the way to your back. So what I like to say, that these counter lines are actually not back mounted. They are just reversed over the shoulder. So just like a, like the standard AP counter lines were over the shoulder. So slightly on the shoulder and on the front, the back mounted are more or less the same, just on the other side, which gives the advantage of it. Because if we have a little bit of the counter lines in the front of our body and a little bit counter lines on the back of our body, uh, the breathing parameters of that counter lines are the best. With the Revo, we have fully back motor counter lines, which means all the counter lines are on your back, which theoretically creates the, wor or the, the worst breathing resistance because there's a, a difference, be uh, pressure difference between your lines and the counter lines. And uh, so we should, we should have uh, not so good breathing performance with the Revo, which is of course not the true. The Revo has one of the best breathing uh, uh, parameters from every CE rebreathers. Actually, it's hard to say uh, which one has a better breathing parameter, the JJ or Revo, because the JJ has 2.0 joules per liter worth of breathing, uh, but this is measured and published with the 75 liters per minute of RLV. And the JJ is 1.8. Adam, I don't even remember, 1.85, I think, or 1.90. 1.85, I think, yeah. Yeah, but that is measured and published for LNV 55 liters per minute. So this is, and that, that, has a, this is a, that has a difference on the work of breathing. So it's hard to compare those. For both units, the breathing is very well. But how did we offset the problem of back mountain contract? Exactly by diameter of, of the gas passage between the counter lines and the stubble, which is very uh, wide. So the gas is traveling there very easily. So here we have our inflate counter lines. And now if my hand is long enough. I could just put it here and go all the way up. And I will get to my inhale hose when the gas is actually traveling to the diver and everything starts again. So all the circulation of the gas is actually done, done like this. So if you can imagine, this is a little bit different geometry of, of gas traveling through the rebreather than every other unit. It's like 19 degrees angle, which has a huge advantage in preventing of channeling. So why is that? Now you, have, you need to use a little bit of your imagination. So if you have other unit struggle, whatever this is, axial radial. Let's let's use, for example, AP as an example. So the axial scrubber, the gas is traveling from the bottom through the scrubber to the top. Okay. And uh, we all know that the channeling occurs when the gas is, is found in some small channel when he can pass through, it can pass through. And then this, the, the scrubbing material around that channel is very quickly. Uh, used and then there is no CO to remove. And the, the, the best example of channeling is, is if you pack your scrubber not correctly, because when then, when, for example, you go on the boat, you are doing this move on the waves, so it's actually like you are packing the scrubber more, then the scrubber, the scrubbing materials goes a little bit down. And then what happens when you dive? You dive in this position. So now, if the scrubber is, is, let's say, meshes down, it goes down because of this tapping, you create a channel here and the gas is passing this channel uh, without CO2 being removed. 
So because when diver is diving in a horizontal position, this is actually the, the, uh, the position of your scrubber and the gas is traveling from here to here. So if we have any channel on the top of the scrubber, the gas will actually pass it through without CO2 being removed. On the river, the scrubber, if the diver is on the horizontal position, is on this orientation and the gas is traveling from the bottom to the top and then goes to the second scrubber from the top to the bottom. So if even if you pack your scrubber incorrectly and you have a channeling, uh, I mean, you have a channel, you won't have a channeling. Imagine even if this scrubber will be half full, okay? There will be still CO2 uh, removed without being channeling. It just, the, the scrubber duration will be less, but there is no CO2, uh, no channeling possible. The only way that the river can channel is if you are diving in upright position, because then we have exactly the same problem as we had in IP or, or, or wherever other unit uh, with the horizontal position and the channeling here. So changing the, the geometry of, of the rebuilder also prevents the channeling because simply gravity helps us not to create the channel in a scrubber. So this is actually uh, the one thing. And the second, uh, second advantage of this different geometry of the rebuilder is that we could split the scrubber into two, uh, two parts. So we have a dual scrubber advantages and a low profile unit, uh, low profile unit uh, advantage. I will take the tank off. And Chema, would you and, mind to answer? Would you mind to answer a few questions for the guys? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Go ahead. So the first question comes from James. He'd like to know: Does the gag strap impede bailing out? Does it make it harder to bail out having a gag strap? Uh, okay, it's a very good question, very often asked by the divers. So actually, uh, the question is no, it, it does not, because the gag strap, uh, right now this one, this gag strap is the, the new one. I mean, the new ones, we have it for, for like two or two years before, it was basically the dragger gag strap, which has a small plastic uh, brackets here. And the idea was that if you need a bailout, you just pull it and you break it, and then the gas are completely loose, is completely loose. Uh, so that was, was a good solution, but the problem is that people was afraid to do this during the courses because this is just one time use, then you have to replace it. So nobody was doing this correctly. So then now we have we have the new Mares uh, uh, design gag strap, which basically is super elastic. And what you do actually, when you are bailing out, you close the loop, you pull your, your, your DSV just, I don't know, a few centimeters away from your mouth, and then you just simply uh, pull it down. When you pull it down, the gag strap simply falls off your, 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 your head and is completely loose. So the, it, it's not difficult, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not disturbing you of bailing out, but you need to learn correct procedure. When, you, when we bail out on the river, we simply close the loop, we pull the DSV down and to the right side, and then the gut strap falls down. So it's, it might sound a little bit complicated, for a more, more complicated procedure than, than without the gut strap. Uh, maybe it is, but it's really worth it. Okay, awesome. Uh, another question is, what are the options to remove water from the rebreather? Um, James was told at the boat show, if you went in a head down trim position to get the water out, how would the electronics be protected from water? Okay, so this is another the most common question for the Revo. First of all, uh, the question, how can we remove the water from the Revo? Exactly the same way as every other unit through the OPV, because the overpressure hole, I don't know if I'll be able to show it to you, okay? Overpressure valve is here, okay? So this overpressure valve is just next to the, uh, the breathing hose connector. So it is installed on the, you know, on the highest point of external chunker line. So if you get any water in, if you really want to get rid of it, you can put yourself slightly head down position and simply inflate the unit. It, it is challenging procedure because you're getting slightly, uh, slightly buoyant. Keep in mind that the Revo counterlung volume is 4.5.5 uh, uh, liters compared to 
eight, nine or 12 or 16 in other units. So it's not that uh, big uh, problem. And if we talk about the electronics, the all electronics in the x height counter lines can be completely submerged. You can, this, what we have here, we have the ADV, we have the, the solenoid board, which is potted completely. So it's waterproof. Here, the cables that are connected to the solenoid are also waterproof and the solenoid uh, itself as well. So there's completely no harm in, in the water on the exhale counter lines elect electronics. Of course, if you get the water into the inhale counter line, there are oxygen sensors, then they will be damaged, of course. But to have the water in the inhale counter line, that water has to travel through the first scrubber, through the, uh, the revo cover, and then through the second scrubber. So you must really, really have a lot of water inside you. You will be able to collect too much water there. Uh, so yeah, that's the thing. But also, uh, what I very often hear as a disadvantage of the Revo, which I fully don't agree with, is that the Revo has a very low resistance for the flooding because of the cantonized volume. Uh, this, is, this is kind of the true. If you have 5.5 liter of the cantalines compared to, let's say, 16 on a Poseidon, if you remember correctly, then of course you can put much more water in it before this, let's say, half half flooded. But think I always say think about it we are reality. What have what may what must happen during the dive that you put like I don't know two liters of water inside the rebreather. You can get the water inside the river on the, inside the rebreather only uh, in two ways. One way you just took the mouthpiece off without closing it. And the second one you have a pinch hole. Summer, you have a pinch hole in the breathing hoses, you have a hole in the counter lines, you, you, one of your o-ring is, is, is leaking, so you'll get the water there. So if you have a, any hole in your loop, so the water gets in through the damaged o-ring, pinch hole, wherever, it actually doesn't matter how much water your unit can take because it will be fully flooded eventually anyway you will get this water constantly in. So that this, this discussion is completely useless. And uh, the, so the only question is, can I take off my loop without folding the unit and how long I can keep it off? So that's, that's this is actually the way how most of the people are folding the units. They just forget to close it or they just come, they jump into the water with the VSD open or accidentally they just lose their lips or maybe because of the very cold water for the long time, uh, time they cannot seal it correctly. So, and for this amount of water, the, you can easily dive with because the river, like every other unit, has kind of the water trap because the counter lines, the counter, the, the uh, extra counter lines ends up like more or less here. Okay, so all the water can just simply stay there, and you can continue the dive. If you have too much water in that in, in the counter line, I know like probably one liter of water will probably already start to be annoying because we see you gargling. You can try to dump it through the OPV, and this is the this is the procedure. Okay, awesome. So Sam asks, what material is the scrubber cover made out of? Um, is it tough or do you need a cave shield? You mean this one? Correct, that one. Okay. So this is actually double layer material. The, here is Berlin. And this, this cover, because it also, as I told you, is a thermal protection. If I'm not wrong, but I'm 90% sure I'm not, this is highly compressed neoprene. That's why you can look at mine, looks like shit already. Is because one day I was traveling with the, the river in the box on my back and two screws were, went underneath it. And it was in the, in the, in the, in the plane. So when I opened my, my Revo, it was really, really those, you can see those holes here. So maybe I can show you this angle. You can see this, this part is, is very highly compressed neoprene. So it, it's quite hard, but also gives the thermal protection. And this one here is a derling. So. I wouldn't use it to, 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 to nail a nail into the table, but uh, many times I've seen people were dropping it and so on, and there's no damaging on it. We usually use it as a tray. 
for host covers. So, so it's actually quite strong. I, I'm not a cave diver, but I, I asked this question to the cave diver and they say that this is very resistant material, even if you, if you punch the, the cover with some piece of the rock or whatever, it is fine. So, but it's okay. quite solid. If you hold it in your hand, you can feel it that it's, this, is, this is not like, I'm sorry to say that AP piece of plastic, no? okay? It's not, it's a really solid, a uh, piece of delving and uh, connected with a very, very highly compressed neoprene. Okay, I awesome. That's a neoprene, but it's something that is not ent ent fully solid. It's something, it's something for this is something foamy. I don't know what that's word. No, perfect. And uh, Martin asks, um, are there less incidents of hypercapnia on the Revo because of the design? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. I'm not following the accidents reports, to be honest, because they're all, all full of bullshit. So I, I don't I don't know. Uh, I I I had I've seen once a situation when my one of my friends, but that was during the course, beginner course, so you know a lot of exercise, but breathing patterns and so on, who actually was a little bit uh, hypercapnia. Uh, but uh, no, that's not happening a lot, not not to my knowledge. So the accidents when that was you know serious accident when the hypercapnia was reported, uh, I don't know. But again, I'm not following those 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 uh, let's say reports much. Okay, awesome. So Stuart asks, can the diver mistakenly place a used scrubber in the top position? Um, and not the bottom position. Yes, it can, he can, because they're exactly the same. If you do it, it means that once you go back from the dive, because nothing will happen to you if you, if you think about it, if you do it accidentally, the top scrubber will not work, but all the CO2 will be removed in the bottom one. But if you do it, you should get out of the water, take the unit off your back, sell it, and don't dive rebreathers. Because it's very, very simple, we have here, a top marker label. So, so this I told you uh, in the beginning that we are cycling the scrubbers. So it means that if the time comes and you, you are about to replace the scrubber, you actually only replace one because as I told you, if everything is fine and there was no issues, the, the top scrubber is doing the job. So now I can actually do the cycling, which means I take the bottom one which is not used, I put it in the top, I replace the, the top one to the to fresh line, okay? And then I put it in the bottom. But now what I have to do, I have to take this top marker off, it is just like a screw and put it here. So I know that now this one is always on the top. So even if I'm not changing this cover because I don't need to, and I'm, Taking this out because I want to dry my unit, dry out my unit side. I know exactly which one should be on the top. So we have this top marker, uh, and we have a clear procedure how to do the cycling. So, which means this is the part of the course. But I will briefly tell you when you do the cycling, in the once you take off the top scrubber, immediately you put it on the bottom, and you immediately empty the top scrubber, the former top scrubber. So you never make a mistake like, okay, now the phone rings, you, you're you distracted and now, okay, I again put the top scrubber back to the used one. So the rule is once you take that off, empty the scrubber immediately and put that on the second scrubber. So you always know that the one with the top scrubber uh, marker on is actually the top scrubber. So theoretically they fit because we change them uh, all the time between the places but it's really it's really you must be stupid to do it really yeah and, and you you know you could put a use scrubber into any rebreather so human factors is a super important part of that um another couple of questions if you don't mind right. um two people have asked us now what's the scrubber duration what's the what's the scrubber duration that's the hardest question to answer uh in terms of revo so c scrubber duration is uh, you, it depends on the warm or the cold water. The cold water is 15 degrees Celsius and below. It's a cold water. 15 degrees, uh, everything above the 15 degrees is a warm water. So 
we, we have always two scrubber times on Revo. We call it a cycle and scrubber time. Cycles time is simply when you can still do the cycling. You can simplify this uh, as this is the time when you can still use the bottom one as a top. Or if you need a longer dive, you can use full scrubber time. So we simply call it scrubber time, which means both of the scrubber have to be uh, replaced after that time. So in the warm water, the cycle time is three hours and the scrubber time is four and a half. So maximum dive time on the river in the warm water, 15 degrees and above is four and a half time. And then you have to replace four and a, sorry, four and a half hours. And uh, then you have to replace both canisters. And after three hours, you have to replace, uh, you can replace the one and do the cycling. Uh, but those numbers actually are not, now not too relevant, relevant because of the RMS. And uh, I will get to the RMS maybe when we finish with all the questions for the moment right now, because this is a brilliant system for the river and I really would like to spend a little bit of time on it. This is the system that is predicting, uh, predicts how much time the scrubber will work. But I will get to that in a, in a, in a moment. So if yeah, super. Uh, any more questions? Maybe let's only, only um, what, what, two more questions. Um, one of them is the black cover looks really nice, but does it heat up more in the sun, causing thermal expansion? And the other question is, does the size of the unit change the scrubber duration? Uh, okay, so the, the second question is yes, no. We are exactly the same scrubbers in every unit. Micro, mini, standard, the, those scrubber canisters are exactly the same. Everything here is exactly the same. It's just the size of this housing is different and it's only about to fit your, your body better. So the duration of the scrubber doesn't change. The heating, the heating of the black, you mean the black cover versus the yellow one, if, that, if, if it's heating up more. That's a good question, actually. It should, right? Because the black color attracts more sun, but uh, you know, you, you don't leave any of, of, of your diving gear on the sun if you don't really have to. So I didn't test it, to be honest, but I believe, yes, I believe on the sun, it will heat up better than the, the yellow one. But again, you should not leave those parts on the sun. It's not only because of the heat, but also because of the uh, ultraviolet, the radiation and all this stuff, right? And I, I, I guess, I, as far as I was aware, the black one's only for instructors and really cool guys anyway. Everybody else yeah. gets the, the yellow one, that right? Was only, that was only in the very beginning. As an instructor, you can get the black one with the instructor label on. Uh, but right now, you can buy the black one as a regular order. They are just only 200 euro more expensive because of the color. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, just a quick, really quick one, and then I'll let you move on with the unit. Um, why did uh, Revo slash Mares decide to have the gas flow direction different to lots of other rebreathers? And to be honest, I don't know exactly what triggered that decision. I think that it's, as I told you, the Paul uh, who was uh, designing the units who was thinking out of the box. Uh, and because I, I don't know any technical uh, let's say disadvantage or advantage on the gas floor left, right, over right, to left, to be honest. So I don't think that was the uh, decision that was made that we have to do it like this because this and that. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's because, because uh, I don't know what was the gas flow direction in Ida, the river that Paul was diving in the very, very beginning. Maybe that this is how it's coming from. Yeah, some of the military rebreathers had rich gas coming from the right and, you know, well, lean gas going to the left, but the, you never know. The, the designer's habits then. Okay, buddy, thank you for answering the questions, my friend. Please carry on. Okay, good. So then I would like to talk to you about two very nice uh, design features about the Rio. The first one is gas injection. So every other unit on the market has a gas injection separated into inhale and exhale side. So usually we have a deal end on the inhale side, the oxygen on the exhale side. And this is how it works, I believe, in every river other than Riva. I know maybe I'm wrong here, I'm not sure, but for sure the majority of the units have that solution. So in Riva, it's different. In Riva, we have the manual injection valve, our MAV that I already showed you once before, okay? 
So MAV is brilliant. It's super simple to operate. You just have it here, very easily accessible. And you have three buttons, the deal one, the, uh, the oxygen is inside. So it's easy to recognize it by feel. And then you can, you can inject any offboard gas that you connect. So you can offboard the deal one, or you can offboard the oxygen in a just simply inject with this button and here we have our uh, let's say outlet hose that goes directly to the exhale counter line so manual injection of both oxygen and diluent is directly into the exhale counter lines and what is the advantage of that solution so uh, for those of you guys who are diving rebreathers you, you, you know very well that the loop flashing procedure, so oxygen flash and diluent flash is an important skill to master during the breather the diving because you, you might have to do it in an emergency scenario. And because of this splitting injection into inhale and the exhale part in every unit, the procedures of the diluent flash and the oxygen flash, they are different. So just for example, to on, on let's say on JJ, if you want to do the, the, the dual flash, you have to make yourself horizontally, tilt yourself slightly on the side, and then open the OPV on the counter line and in, inject the dual button on, on, on the other side. So you have to make yourself correct position. Otherwise, you will simply inflate full your counter lines and most likely you will end up on the surface. On the AB with the front mounted counter lines, you have to do something like this. So you have to find yourself in a good position. The oxygen flash is usually very simple in every unit. You just press the button, you tilt your head up, and you let the gas go out around the lips. So the gas is going all the way around your units and it's going out through uh, the, around your lips. So the oxygen flash procedure is much easier than the villain flash. And on the Revo, with that easier, easier procedure, which is oxygen flash procedure in every other units also applies to diluent flash. So in other words, to make it simple, whatever if I want to, to do the diluent flash or I want to do the oxygen flash, the, all I need to do is just to tilt my head up and press the button. That's all I need to do. So it's much easier. I don't have to fight with my with my position correct for the, for the skill. I don't have to open over pressure valve. I just simply tilt my head up and press the button. And the, being able to do the full flash uh, with the diluent or oxygen doesn't matter uh, which procedure you do is it is very important for your safety because for those of you who are not diving rebreathers yet the diluent flash for example is one of the solutions for every problem with the gas inside the rebreather because the diluent is always almost always a breathable gas so if you have any doubts if that your gas inside the rebreather is, is good if, if you have any let's say uh, symptoms of whatever, hypoxia, hyperoxia, you can always do the diluent flash and then you know what does your breathing. You're breathing your diluent, which is air, for example, right? So diluent flash is very good. Uh, it's very important skill to master just for your safety. And for the Revo, with the Revo, it's super, super easy. And also, because of the countenance volume, it takes literally two to three seconds. Usually the diluent flash procedure in other units just because of the, because the, of, of, of the uh, geometry of the unit design and the size of the counter lines, you have to flash the unit for several seconds. Depends on the unit, depends on the counter line size, but it never takes like nearly two seconds. On the Revo, if I do really this, now I'm reading pure, pure diluent, which is really nice, really safe and really fast to react. So whatever happens, you just do this and you know that you're breathing air, pure air, for example, if you're doing this air or pure uh, trimix, if you're doing this trimix, but for sure, you know that you're, you're breathing the safe gas. So this is very nice design because I don't have two buttons on two sides. I have just one MAV here that allows me to inject any of the gases I want, whether it's diluent or the oxygen. And also if I want to connect offboard gas, it doesn't matter if I'm connecting offboard oxygen or I'm connecting offboard diluent, I just connect it here and I inject it here and that's it. So it's super simple, super nice. And this MAV is, is, is 
always super accessible. Even if you dive with four or even five stages around yourself, you always have easy access to it. So manual addition is super easy. I, I, I never found any unit with which so much easy manual injection as a, as a Revo. So this is because the oxygen and the deal went injection are exactly in the same place, which is X high counterline in the Revo. So this is the one thing I wanted to tell you. And the second one is already mentioned RMS. So the RMS, the Revo monitoring system is super sophisticated system that is brilliant. I love it. Everybody love it, loves it, and it's, it's brilliant. And also, if I didn't mention, it's brilliant. So what is RMS doing, actually? So uh, RMS is uh, the system that is doing, actually, two things. The first, it is constantly analyzing what's your scrubber condition and is calculating your scrubber condition. And it is the, and it's displaying on the screen of your computer how much time in minutes your scrubber will last. So how does it work? Inside the scrubbers, we have this very funny shape for horizontal pins. These are temperature probes. You already know the temperature probes if you were watching the previous Adam videos from AP. AP also has a pump stick, which is a temperature probe inside the scrubber, simply because we know that when the CO2 is removed, the chemical reaction that occurs uh, creates a heat. So if the CO2 reaction is on, there's a heat. So now if we can recognize if there is a heat or not, we can say that the scrubber works simply. We know that we always produce the CO2. If we are alive, we are metabolizing the oxygen. So we are producing the CO2 because the CO2 is a byproduct of the uh, oxygen uh, metabolism. So we always produce the CO2. So if everything works fine in your rebreather, you always have this chemical reaction somewhere. So you always have the temperature increase somewhere in your scrubber where that reaction occurs. So what Revo has designed is, the, is this very fast responding and highly accurate. They can recognize the temperature difference of 0.3 Celsius. That's why they are so expensive. <clears throat> so they can recognize the temperature change very fast and very accurate. And also what is important, they can recognize this temperature difference, not in the center road of the scrubber, but in every, this horizontal pin. Every, this, every, every pin is a one, actually there are two temperature probes inside. So it can measure very accurate what's the temperature in each zone of the scrubber material. So now taking this data into the calculation and all the other factors that are actually affecting the scrubber duration, such as depth, the water temperature, what is actually even taken into consideration is your gender and your weight. You enter those data into the computer. So RMS knows how much CO2 you probably will produce. It knows what's the temperature of the water it knows what is the depth, which also affects the scrubber duration. And now the RMS is taking all this temperatures measurement into consideration. And based on those data, it can calculate how much time your scrubber will last. And you, you have this information exactly on your screen. Just, I this is a little bit more advanced, but I will simply explain you why having dual scrubber and accurate temperature probes we can we can do it imagine that the gas is traveling as i told you first to the top scrubber and then it goes to the bottom scrubber so if the first scrubber is removing whole all co2 then there should not be any reaction on the bottom scrubber right because there is no co2 if there is any heat increase recognized in the first pin, 
the top fin of, of the bottom scrubber, it means some CO2 already has passed through the first scrubber, which means this scrubber is not anymore working correctly. We still have this one fully fresh. The second one is fully fresh, but as long, uh, sorry, at the moment as it starts to heat up on the, on the top, the RMS knows, okay, now the first one is gone or almost gone because it's not always like zero one, zero one. It's a little bit here, a little bit here. But at least this is how we can, he can uh, uh, calculate or, or measure where is our reaction zone. And based on that number, he can calculate how much time still we have. And now there was a question in the beginning, how, how what's the scrubber duration for Revo? I, I just gave you the C numbers because the RMS could not be a part of the part of the C testing. Uh, so we have we need to have a scrubber duration times if we have no RMS. And these are the numbers I just told you. But in real life, you have to think about one uh, one one thing. What is actually using the scrubber material? Is it time? Because when you say the scrubber is working for three hours, yeah, or scrubber is working for four and a half hours, but is it really the true that the time is consuming uh, the scrubber? Of course, it's not, because what is consuming the scrubber is the CO2. So it depends how much CO2 you will produce, your scrubber will last less or long or more or less. So if you imagine diving three hours in a strong current against it and swimming like a hell. And now compare this to three hours lying down on the sun with the on the sand with the camera and waiting for the picture of your life. Of course, the diver who is lying down on the sand will consume or uh, sorry will produce much less CO2 in this three hour period than the diver that is fighting against the current entire dive. So that will affect the scrubber duration. But because we are not able to estimate how much CO2 we will actually produce during the dive, we have to assume something. We have to give ourselves some limits. And those limits are very simple. With the CE testing conditions, you are, the, the unit is, is, is submerged in the ANSTI machine, and then the breathing simulation is start, started, and then they simulate that your body, the machine, is producing 1.6 liters of CO2 per minute, which is a lot to produce the 1.6 liter of the co2 you have to metabolize around 1.7 1.8 liters of oxygen per minute which is really really heavy heavy effort but you you have to consider that maybe someday you will dive like this so you need to know how much cover will last so the c testing conditions are very rough because it's better to have a limit for the rough condition conditions and then use it in a better one and be safe uh, compared to the opposite one, right? So we have those limits, but we, we know that those limits are for the very rough conditions, but we have to do it like this because we don't know maybe those conditions will happen one day to us. And during the dive, we are not able to measure how much CO2 did we produce. So we have to keep, uh, we have to stick, stick to those limits. There's no other way to do it. But, if we have the way to do it, because we can calculate during the dive by checking the temperature uh, reactions on every part of our scrubber, we can then say, let's say after one hour, we used 15% of our absorbing material because the 15% of the absor absor absorbing material has no reaction anymore, which means CO2 is not removed there, which means this scrubber is already used. So if we know that we have two scrubbers in total that can work for this amount of time or this amount of temperatures should occur when it's still valid, then if we have those data and we have collect correct algorithm that was designed by Revo, we can actually calculate how much time we can still breathe if the conditions will not change. This is a very important uh, state, statement because the RMS is always displaying on your screen how much time you still have 
before your scrubber will end at the same conditions at, at the moment when you look on that number. So if you are relaxed and you're swimming very, very relaxed and you're producing not much CO2, you look on your computer and you only see six hours. It's really a possible number. Six hours in the warm water, if you're diving not, not very deep and uh, you're not producing much CO2, you can easily use it for six hours because in six hours, you will produce that amount of the CO2 that will completely uh, deflate your scrubber. So you will see that on the screen. But now, when you start to swim against the current because the conditions will change, you will start to produce more CO2. Well, what that will affect is that the more CO2, more temperature. So the RMS will very quickly recognize it Okay, so he will not he will recognize. Okay, so the temperature inside the scrubber has increased from I don't know 45 degrees to 55, which means there's more CO2 coming in. So that means I have to reduce the scrubber prediction, and within 10 minutes from the six hours on the screen, you will get four or, or three. Okay, then your the current has stopped, or you swim away from it, and you go back to normal CO2 production. So what will happen, the temperatures in your scrubber will go back to normal. So yes, this RMS will again recognize it. And then he was, okay, he will, he, will, he will calculate, okay, so now less CO2 is coming in. So the, what has left will give you now five and a half hours. So this is very nice system to have because to summarize it, it, it gives you the real scrubber consumption or real scrubber usage measured in minutes compared to just let's stick to the C limits uh, option because it can actually measure how much scrubber did you consume based on the high accurate and multi points uh, temperature measurement inside your scrubber. So uh, practically speaking, uh, I just give you an example. My wife, uh, she can do. Some, I remember the trips when we was diving in Egypt, when we was diving not so deep, and she's very little CO two producer. She did like ten hours on the Revo scrubber before the system told her you have to replace it. And it's really possible, and I know many people who can do it, especially females, because they generally they produce less CO two. They can really do several hours on the unit, and and this is not you know this is not out of the blue. Right now we are talking about probably thousands, if not uh, a million, of dives on, in total done on the Revo with RMS, and it works. I guarantee the system works. The prediction that the RMS gives us. I never ever had a problem with it. I never ever even heard about anybody had a problem. I mean, the problem that somebody had a prediction of like, let's say 30 minutes, but he had a CO2 break. It never happened. So this algorithm is really accurate, it works. And, and the, the beauty of that, of that system is that, that it adjusts the, the, the scrubber uh, duration to your real CO2 production, not to uh, the CO2 assumption, let's call it. So this is very nice. But what is even more important with the RMS is safety. Because this is what I'm always fighting with, with the instructors and, and, and emphasizing during the courses that we have to explain to the people how to use it correctly. Because the RMS is not only about I'm consuming less line. It is the advantage of it, but it's not the most, most important. The most important is, is safety. If you think about it, how the RMS can save your life, I can, I can risk the following statement. Using the RMS correctly, you can predict any type of CO2 breakthrough failure in your unit. And I'm gonna uh, explain you why. So what may happen that this, you have the CO2 breakthrough in your unit. So what, what can happen with your rebuilder that uh, it's not removing the CO2 correctly? So let, let's, let's take two examples. First one, mushroom valve failure, okay? So your, your one-way valves that are actually 
causing the, creating the gas traveling only in one direction, which is necessary to simply pull the scrubber, pull the, pull the gas to the scrubber. If the machine wall fails, then I'm inhaling, okay? I'm taking the oxygen, I'm producing CO2, I'm exhaling, and now the gas with the CO2 is going a little bit on the left, a little bit on the right. Now I'm inhaling, so I'm sucking back the CO2. It will never get to the scrubber. And I, this is how I get the CO2, the CO2 poisoning. So what will RMS do then? So imagine I'm breathing, so everything is fine. The CO2 goes to my scrubber, so it heats up at some level, let's say, random number 45 degrees is the, the temperature in the, in the zone when the reaction happens. And now from some reason, my machine valve stopped working. So I'm not pushing the CO2 to my scrubber, which immediately will create the temperature to decrease. So my RMS, he, he will not recognize it as a machine valve fighter, but what the RMS will do, it will tell me now, I had a four hours and 30 minutes prediction and I look, one minute later, I have 30 minutes left. So that should trigger an alarm in my mind that something is not necessarily correct. Because if one minute ago, I looked at my RMS and it showed me you have still four and a half hours. And after one minute, when nothing has changed, I didn't produce more CO2, I'm not diving against the current, I'm not deeper, the water is not colder. And I see I have 15 minutes left, it means, that there is no reaction zone. No reaction zone, no CO to remove. And I'm still producing it because I'm breathing. So by cor correctly understanding the readings of the RMS, you can actually prevent the, the machine failures in terms of the CO2. If for some reason you will have breakthrough, let's say the channeling, okay? So for some reason you manage to make a channeling on the river. So the gas will pass through that channel so the, CO, the absorbing material will be very fast to remove around it. And then there was no CO to remove uh, in the scrubber and the CO2 will pass through the scrubber. So what will happen? There will be no chemical reaction in the scrubber. So there will be no heat. If there is no heat, the RMS again will calculate that as uh, reduced in the scrubber duration. So you will see it immediately on your screen. So again, if any other conditions didn't change, so you, you don't swim against the current, you don't go deeper, it's not colder, and your RMS prediction dropped dramatically in the short period of time, this is the indication for you that something is wrong with the scrubber removing system. And this is where you should go and write out and check it out. So whatever, wherever scrubber system failure you may have, it's always if the scrubber system Fails, it means it doesn't remove the CO2. If it doesn't remove the CO2, the temperature inside the scrubber will go down and RMS will understand it as the scrubber is almost over. So it will dramatically reduce the prediction on your screen. And you should, as a diver, you should be able to read it correctly and understand it correctly. So if you know that this should not happen, it means something is wrong. So the RMS is not only about saving the line. It is saving the line as well, because it actually tells you to replace the scrubber when it is actually used, not after fixed amount of time. But the most important is your safety. By understanding how it works and, and learn how to read those numbers, you can actually recognize any kind of CO2 uh, removing system fire. So this is a huge advantage of, of, uh, of the RMS. RMS sounds fantastic, Jemek, and uh, I can see you're really passionate about it. Um, yeah, a <laughs> couple, couple of questions, if you don't mind. No um, Greg's said that some people complain that RMS is a bit hit and miss. What do you suggest to look after the temperature probes and keep it working properly? Sorry, I had the, I had the connection break. Can you repeat the question? Of course. Um, some people have complained that RMS being a bit hit and miss. What do you suggest to look after the temperature probes and keep the RMS working? Uh, I just want to make sure I understand the question correctly in English. You mean that the, the, some people complain that the, the RMS is not working? Yeah, sometimes it doesn't work. It doesn't come on. Not that it gives a bad yeah, prediction. Okay. Yeah, so sure. I know that I understand the question very, very well. Okay, so uh, it is a little bit from the past. The first, let's say, version of temperature probes, they had some issues that if the unit was 
maybe not even flooded, but it was too much humidity inside the rebreather. That humidity with the depth was pushed inside the probe with the pressure and then there's electronics inside and the, that's why the temperature probes uh, was was not functioning well. And uh, the problem we had, it's uh, that uh, after a while, the temperature probe didn't connect to the system because they connect actually wirelessly. This is actually uh, the, the temperature probe uh, connection and it lays down on the, on the computer board and they connect using the induction technology. And uh, in the beginning, the problem that is actually correct, that there, there was a quite big problem to be honest in the beginning that uh, after a few months, one temperature probe didn't connect. So we had no connection. And if there is no two probes, the system will not work. <coughs> First of all, it is now a lot, a lot improved. To be honest, uh, since like a year or so, uh, I didn't, I didn't have any problem with the probes. All my students and their and their the, the friends are diving Revo with the new probes. Also, luckily, they don't have any problems. So things like they fix it. They also the Revo also told me that they, they found the reason why it was the problem and they actually fix it. Uh, so uh, so basically, uh, that was a little bit of the Revo fault in the beginning, we can say. But now it's much more improved. The problem is not occur or doesn't occur with the with the with the, with the current. It's a Revo, and also if you have the older old older unit, you can always buy a new probe. It's not the cheapest uh, part. I think it's something like 180 or 200 euros uh, one probe. But once we replace it, and you have the new one from the new new batch, and then it's much much improved. What you can do to even help them not to 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 to, to break uh, is try not to keep them in the humid environment for too long. What, uh, what people will very often do is like, uh, remember there's always a lot of humidity in your scrubber because uh, the water is one of the reaction, uh, part, uh, reaction, chemical reaction component that is needed. So if, if you know that you'll be not diving for the next week or so, even if your scrubber still have like two or three hours of prediction, empty it's like 1.3 kilos a line it's not much money it's really not worth it and then if you empty it you let this uh, you let the probe air dry and i'm sure it will improve uh, the lifetime of, of the probe because the reason why the we had that problem was simply the humidity that was pushed inside the probe uh once you once you were diving because of the pressure so less okay, awesome. it, the better no, it sounds good. And, you know, with all these rebreathers, we, we've got to go through a process of, of uh, a little bit of development, you know, as, yeah. a, as a rebreather manufacturers, they're relatively um, small companies, they do a lot of testing, but when you take something into the field and technical divers aren't always the, the, the best with their machines, we figure out what goes wrong and fix it. So that's great news. A um, couple of questions from Sam. What is the stupidest mistake or shortcut that people make with this rebreather? Hmm. A good question. What is the stupid mistake? <laughs> no, that, that, that's funny because nothing comes much to my to my mind right now. Okay, I have one. Uh, also, historically, I mean historically, I guess, like five six years ago, uh, people were putting uh, this. I don't know how you call this in English because I call it Swami, but I know I don't know if just that's correct word. That this is the C approved oxygen clean revo moisture absorbent. <laughs> it's a it's a chamois leather, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we are using this like many rebuilders does. We are using this this part to put in the bottom of inhale counter line because there is a lot of space. So if there is any any humidity or extra watering, it will just soak in. What people were doing, they're actually putting those, 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 those moisture absorbent into the exhale counter line as well, because there's also, as I told you, a space for the water. Okay. So, and this was a mistake because as I told you, the counter line, they are one on top of each other. And right now I'm actually squeezing the bottom counter line. So I'm prevent, I'm, I'm blocking the gas to flow. Does it, does it make sense what I just said, Adam, in English? 
Yeah, absolutely. It makes complete sense. Um, and, and just give me the name again. What's, what's the real name for that? That yeah, that pink chamois? Chami. No, the, the Revo name. Ah, the Revo name is a C-approved oxygen clean moisture absorbent. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. I should order some to clean the car. Um, yeah. And Sam's other question, if there's one specific part of this rebreather you could improve, what would it be? But I guess not much because you are on the development team for the rebreather anyway. <laughs> no, actually there is. There is and then... And, uh, okay, I cannot say that. But yeah, there is. So uh, I, I would... Uh, what I'm missing in the Revo actually is there is no shut off for the ADV. It's simply because the ADV is, is, is here. It's, it's on the... On the so noise tray inside the loop. So there's this hose goes directly here to the first stage. So it's it's actually there's no no place when you could install the shut off. You could you could actually install it here on that hose, but it will be probably quite hard to reach it. So if I would improve something, if one day real forward came out, it will for sure have it. Uh, the shut off for the ADV, that's that's the one thing I would improve. Uh, what else uh, I would improve in that unit? I had something, so there were two things that was always bothering me that we could we could do better. Uh, the shut off for the ADV, oh, okay. And the second thing is uh, the, the Molex connector, uh, because if, uh, if you look, uh, okay, you have to look, but you can see that the, the Molex connector for the oxygen sensor, they are permanently connected to the sensor board. This is the second computer. The, the first one is on top, and the, on the bottom is also the computer, the, the one that is reading the sensor, uh, uh, sensor readings and send it over the network to the other devices. And those cables are permanently potted inside that, that electronics. So remember that the uh, oxygen sensor, they produce the current, and remember that there's also always humidity in the unit, just because you're breathing. So the current, electrical current plus humidity, they don't like each other. And the result is uh, if you don't dry this sensor tray after the dive, then you may get a corrosion on the Molex connector. And because you cannot replace the Molex connector, because it's permanently potted inside the electronics, you have to replace all the sensor board electronics parts, which is a little bit expensive. It's like also 230 euros or so. So if that cables, you, you could just simply disconnect the damaged cable and, and just buy the new cable, that would be nice. Okay, cool. Well, another question. So when you pick the sensor board up there, a lot of people notice the Reva has five sensors yeah. when all the other machines we've looked at so far has three. Can yes. you give me a little idea why? And also why the cost isn't as big as people would imagine? Okay, good. So uh, to answer the, for the question why the Reva has five sensors, I, I have to explain what electronic options do we have for Reva, okay? So right now we have actually two options for the Revo electronics. Revo is basically based on the Shiwot electronics. So uh, we always have one main computer. We can call it the controller, which uh, can be the petrol or for example, NERD, right? So this, com this computer has always three oxygen sensors, just like every other unit does. So this is why we have uh, here, three oxygen sensor, one, two, three, and this is how the sonar is operating based on, and so we change the set points, everything like on every other unit. We have the three sensors, voting, logic, and so on and so on. But then we always have need to have a backup monitoring system. So, and now we have multiple options. We may have the NERD as a monitoring system. This is actually what I'm using in my unit right now. You can see I have also NERD in my unit. So right now, my main computer is my petrol with three sensors, and the nerd is my backup with two sensors connected into it. This is why I have five oxygen sensors because three of them are for the petrol, my computer, my main control, and two of them are for the nerd, the monitoring system. The alternative for the nerd, the triple alternative, by the way, this is a mini, so you can see that it's not much bigger. Actually, this is the micro button with a stand on, 
so you may not see the difference much, but you can see that on this unit, I have so-called a Revo Dream. A Revo Dream is very simple design, one sensor reading monitor system. It does nothing else, just display the partial pressure of the oxygen from one, actually it can be connected to two oxygen sensors, then it displays uh, in three seconds interval, sensor number one, sensor number two, sensor number one, sensor number two. But what, what we use, use to do, usually do if I'm using the Revo Dream, I have two Revo Dreams on one unit, okay? And then the sensor number four and sensor number five is connected to the Revo Dream. So this is actually a very big advantage of the, of the Revo. And I'm gonna say something right now that many people hate me to, for saying that, but this is true. The Revo is the only unit on the market that has real electronic redundancy because the Revo is the only one unit by the factory default settings that we have real redundant systems. If you think about redundancy is when the unit are completely, the, the, the solutions are completely redundant. And in every other unit, even if you have two she waters, you have she water and a hood, you have two handsets whatsoever, you always connect them to the same three oxygen sensors. So if the sensor fails, none of the electronics works. On the Revo, it's, it's different. Every electronics has its own computer, his own power, so the, his own battery, his own cable completely not connected to any, any other electronics and, it, and its own oxygen sensors. So they're actually completely independent. Whatever part of the system will fail, the other ones are fully functional. And this is actually redundancy. What we have in every other unit is not the redundancy. It's part, it's only display redundancy, you can call it. But if they are using still the same oxygen sensor, just for example, if you take JJ, we have hood and we have shell water, but they're all connected to the same three oxygen sensors. In the Revo, every electronics has its own oxygen sensors. So that's completely redundant. So this is why we have five oxygen sensors to have full redundancy. And uh, the version with the Revo Dreams, if we, have, if we have two Revo Dreams, we actually have three completely independent systems because all of the systems has their own display, their own battery, then all their own cable and their own oxygen sensor. That's why the, the, you may found, find on, on the internet the name Revo Expedition. Revo Expedition is simply the, the, the version, version of Revo when you have the Shewater controller, whether it's a Petra or Nerd, and two Revo Dreams. Because then you have completely independent two electronics. And if you go far away for expedition, like, I don't know, you go to Maladies, or you go to, to North Pole diving, wherever you go, if any of the electronics fail, any of any part of the electronic system fail, you still have to work it. So you can even go for the decompression dives. Theoretically, if we have, if we have, uh, let's pick any unit, okay, Where, wherever, unit you, you choose, if you have one computer and a hood, or you have two computers, if one of them fail and you're on a safari boat, you cannot go diving unless you're diving on decompression dive, because you should not go diving into decompression dives without at least one backup uh, monitoring system of what you're breathing. So if you have the Revo Expedition version, so Petrel or NERD and two Revo Dreams, even if you're on a safari boat and on the second day, one uh, electronics fail, you still have two, so you can still go diving because you still have the backup monitoring system. So the five sensors is because the three are always to your main computer. Let's call this controller. And then the two additional sensors are for your moni the backup monitoring. And this backup monitoring can be the nerd, can be actually second petrol if you want, can be one or two new units. So this is actually also a very nice feature of the uh, Any questions about that, Adam?
No, it sounds like a really nice explanation of the two. And you choose for your personal machine a nerd with two cells and a petrol with the other three cells, correct? Yes, yes it's actually, I, actually that was my choice. Uh, I like the nerd. It's really, really nice. I like it, especially because uh, it's very helpful for uh, the, the bailout rebreather. Uh, I don't want to get into that too much because I will bore you too much. But the, the biggest problem if, if you die for the bailout rebreather is how to calculate the, the decompression. Because you know your repo computer is, cal is calculating everything fine, fine up to the point when it breaks. And after it does, does, does not, your bailout rebreather is calculating basically nothing until you start breathing from it. So why do, how do I get a, the, the accurate decompression calculation? And the NERD as a monitoring has a nice feature since I think two, two or three last Kirlan update is, has a nice feature that during the dive, you can switch uh, the, you can switch the oxygen, uh, how you call it? You can switch the option where it is, where is it taking the oxygen contents to calculate the, the deco. You can choose, take it from the sensors or you can switch to fixed PO2, like an external computer. So you can do it during the dive. That's why actually uh, uh, I choose the NERD as a backup. So now when I'm diving on a bailout rebreather, if I'm bailing out on a rebreather, I just switch on my NERD. Now you calculate my deco based on fixed 1.3 PO2. And then the decompression obligation on my nerve is accurate because he knows what I was breathing before. And now he knows I will be breathing fixed PO2 1.3 and the vehicle calculation will be accurate. Okay, super. And again, I don't think the guys saw, but the, the Revo Dreams also have a head up display. So you ah, get yes, to see. Yes, 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 yes. That was my mistake. I forgot about it. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Adam, for reminding me. Uh, the thing is that if you choose to use uh, the, the Revo Dreams, then each Revo Dream uh, has one head-up display. So because you've seen that unit has a two Revo Dreams, I have two, uh, two head-up displays. Uh, there are three LEDs, uh, the orange, green, and red. So obviously green, everything is fine. Orange is too low, red is too high. So you have it always in front of the mask, which is super safe. Good. So how 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 are we with time? How much time do we have, to, uh, Adams? Do we go? We 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 we're, we're going. We're going through the time quickly, but it's very interesting, my friend. So please continue if you've got time. Okay. So because what will be good to do now? Then I want to show you how to build up the unit. To do so, I'm gonna just take the look off my unit. Okay, while you take your unit off, I just um, have a quick chat to the guys. It's nice to see you all, and um, thank you for all your questions. Continue to ask us questions as, as, as we go through. Chemex now going to go through the pre-dive assembly and the closed check. Um, so it's how to build the Revo ready for diving. He can do it a bit quicker this time if you want to stay with us because he's um, done a lot of the explanations we go through. What you'll notice um, with, the, with the Revo is that it's quite a, a, quite a quick build process because it doesn't break down into too many parts. Um, and that's gonna be a really, really nice feature for when you wanna build the rebreather in a quick space of time. Okay, buddy, you about yeah. about there? Go ahead. Do you, do you see the unit well, Adam? Or you want you to adjust the camera somehow? No, it looks perfect, buddy, carry on. Okay, good. So as usually, we are using the SSI checklist. So I have it printed here. So the first one is, of, of course, analyze the, the tanks and check the pressure. I, I already did that in my dive center. So I have my tanks here. This is my oxygen. And there is my diluent. So install both cylinders on the unit and verify correct, correct installation. So as I told you, we have this uh, quick time fixation. I just put four pins in, slide in, and it's there. Then I do the same with the... Uh, the diluent. Okay, it's on. Okay. Uh, okay, so now verify the millivolts of the oxygen sensors. So basically, what I'm checking here is to make sure that my oxygen sensors are fine. So I just turn on my shoe water. 
check the millivolts 10.1, 10.9, 10.5. So I'm within the range. I do the same for my nerve because there are two uh, additional sensors. So I have to also check them out. 9.8 and 10.8, which is good. Okay, now the very five, the youngest oxygen sensors is a less than seven months and, and all uh, seven months old and reading correctly, replace if necessary. So here we start for the moment. So Revo recommendation is you replace one oxygen sensor every six months. So you don't replace five sensors a year. You replace one oxygen sensor uh, uh, sorry, one oxygen sensor every six months. And the reason for that is it's mathematically proved, proven that this is the better way to rotate the oxygen sensors because you're, you are reducing the probability that the majority of the system will fail. For those of you who are interested more about this, there is a nice article about this. It's called uh, Understanding Oxygen Sensors. You can download this on the Revo website read it through, it's nicely explained. I'm not gonna go into that theory right now, but if you replace one oxygen sensor every six months, you get much more, uh, let's say, safety com compared to replace all of them at the same time every year. So it is also, uh, uh, you know, money-wise much better because if you, if you calculate, you spend two, uh, two sensors a year, you spend money for two sensors every year compared to three or five. So, in uh, other words, I just take a, take a look on my sensors and make sure that, it, that I have one sensor younger than seven months, which means I did replace it. So I don't have to replace it yet. Here is one of my sensors. The sensor is from January 2020, so it's fine. Okay, secure the moisture absorber in the inhale counter lungs un under the anti collapse tube. So this is our see approved oxygen clean Revo moisture absorbent. I just put it down here. So if there will be any humidity, it will stay there. Okay, install the sensor grid and the solid solenoid grid and verify if the cable routing is correct. So I just simply put my sensor tray here and my solenoid tray, I put it here and now check the routing of the cable is correct. Correct, all is fine. No. So, next point, fire the solenoid for at least 10 seconds or three times and verify if the external batteries reach greater than 6.5 volts. So my controller is my battery, obviously. So I just simply change the set point to higher than it is right now. I don't know if you can hear it or not, but it's, it's clicking. Not firing because the tank is closed, but doesn't have to, it just needs to, to, to consume the, the power. Now I go back to my point 19 set point and I can check now the voltage. I have eight volts, which is fine. My battery is okay. So inspect the remaining time on scrubbers and if needed, refill. So I'm going to my computer. I wanna show you the screen, which will not tell you much but you will learn on the course how to read it. But here on the scrubber menu, I have, can you see it Adam? A little bit closer buddy, just a tiny bit closer. There we go, we can see it, yeah. Okay, so actually what I can read from this information is if I will dive up to 20 meters, my scrubber will last for two hours if I go, uh, if I will be diving deeper than 40 meters, then I have to reduce that time accordingly. Uh, I will not get that go into too much into the details, but here I have the log from the RMS that I can see after the dive I did last time on these covers. I know exactly how much time I, I can still. I can still do. Actually, my scrubber one is empty because I told you I'm emptying the scrubbers if I know that I will not dive in for too much long time. So this is actually not the true, but if I feel those, if I feel the scrubbers completely new, I know I still, I have for sure for a half hour. And then after the first dive with completely new scrubbers, I will use this actually feature to calculate how much time I have. 
Okay, so install the scrubber canisters into the unit. The top marker on the X high side, RMS arrows point up. There are small arrows here that should be pointed up. I'm not gonna go too much into details why is that because then we spend here in hours. Okay, now inspect the o scrubber o rings, clean ceiling surface if grease if needed. So here are my o rings. I have to check if they are clear. Actually, I was cleaning them when I was preparing my union for this presentation. So they are nice and clean. Also, here the ceiling surface on my cover is good to just grease it from time to time. So it works much better. Now close the cover and screw it hand tight. So I just close the cover. I like to do it with the unit angle slightly so it's easier to me. I simply just do like this, close the cover and I have to find my screw. Okay. That's it, it's tight and it's sealed. Okay, now inspect the non retro mushroom valves in the breathing loop. So we do it the same way as we do it in every unit. Mine looks fine. Okay, so inspect the mouthpiece o rings on the breathing loop and clean ceiling surface. So o rings on the loop are here. I just check if they are fine. I don't see any damages and also the mouthpiece. Remember that inspecting the mouthpiece is important part of every rebreather uh, checks because the mouthpiece is the only part of the rebreather that doesn't take part of any test, but it is taking a part of your diving. So if you will have a pinch hole here, there is no single test that will recognize it, but you will get the water in during the dive. So my, my mouthpiece is fine, okay. So now install the breathing loop on the unit. So I simply install it on the unit. I just screw it hand tight. There's no, no point to screw it too, too, too strong because it doesn't have any impact on the ceiling. Perfect. And the last line of pre jump check is uh, wrap the hood cable three or four times clockwise around the loop. I don't have a hood cable, but I have my nerd and I don't like to wrap the nerd around it. I just simply clip it like this and I leave it outside. I think I didn't put my regulators in, no I. I think we have, a, we have here, a, we have to fix it because there is no, information about the regulator on the checklist. Okay, so now, if you could see, my unit is fully built up. And actually, it's ready to make a final test, with uh, final test, what we, which we call the close check. The close check is a, a detailed check of every part of the unit if it's working correctly and uh, functioning properly. So the build-up was very simple. You've seen that my unit was completely stripped out. There's not much I could disassemble it from it anymore. So we st if we store it in the house or in our dive center or wherever, we just store it like that. So the, the scrubbers are out, the counter lines are open so they can nicely air dry inside. The tanks can be disconnected in this. And that what, this is what, what I did was just simply uh, the unit build up. I just assembled everything to get together. And now I will just make all the tests to make sure that every part of my rebuilder works correctly. And this is the test that you should do every dive you die in the morning or whenever, but just every dive. You don't have to do it before every dive. Before the every dive, you just do the pre-jump check, but the close check should be done every day before you start the diving. So, Slowly. Chema, do you, so, sorry, do you have the little uh, board that comes with the with the P clip on it that we use uh, that comes with the Revo? I think that's a really nice feature if the guys can see it with the close check and pre jump. The Revo checklist. Yes. Yeah, I have it. I have it. I have it here. That's a good idea to show it. Hold on a second. 
So every river comes with a checklist and graved like this. This is exactly what I will do right now because on, on, on that checklist, we have the close check and we have the pre-jump check, the one that we do just before we jump to the wall, just before we splash. And here is this close check where we check all this detailed function of the rebreather. So we have it every river diver that gets it with the unit. So we usually keep it onto the viewing and we always have it with us. I really like that, that idea. Okay, so slowly open the oxygen valve, check the cylinder pressure and manually add gauss gas to ver verify proper functions of the oxygen manual addition valve. So I'm slowly opening the oxygen tank. Okay. I have 100 bar. I take my manual addition valve. I just press and make sure that the needle is not dropping down. I know it works correctly. Now the next point is turn on the shear water and set set point to high. Fire the sonoid for three times. So now I will actually hear it because the oxygen is open. I need three times to make sure it works correctly, and then I will check the battery. Remember that the the, pre, uh, the the unit assembly could be done the yesterday, so the next day is also a good idea to check if the batteries are fine. Okay, change the set point to point 19, so it's not firing. Perform three full oxygen flashes with the DSV. So I'm going to do the sensor calibration soon, so I want to flash the unit with the pure oxygen. And because the Revo has the, if you remember correctly, the manual injection or the sonoid injection is in the top counter line and the sensor are in the bottom counter line, I cannot really do it this easy way like we have with the JD or IP when we choose the calibration and the unit is firing the, the oxygen itself. If I do this with the Revo, I, I, will, I will use much, much oxygen before the unit will actually be fully flashed because oxygen will be injected in the top counter line and the uh, oxygen sensor on, on, on the bottom. So I will spend much too much gas to do it. So to make it efficient, we do this flashes, let's call it manually. So I will be in, inhaling the gas from the unit and exhaling the gas out to my nose. I do it few times, uh, actually exactly three times. And so I know that in the unit, I have pure oxygen. Okay, so the third time when I did it, the unit is full of oxygen. Now I have to slightly open the gap. So the unit equalizes the pressure. So there is no overpressure inside. So right now I have in the unit pure oxygen at ambient pressure. Good. So turn on the Revo Dreams and calibrate them. So I'm not using the Revo Dreams, I'm using the, the NERD as a, as a backup monitoring system. So I, I will. Just turn on the nerd and calibrate it. Fine. And now the next point calibrate the shoe water. By the way, Adam, if you have, uh, if you, because you sent me this file, I think it's an old version because I see here some mistakes that we corrected, I believe, you know? So we have to double check if you get it from the website or not. Because Sorry, but I stole it from our ITD Dropbox. Ah, so that's why. So probably it's, we have to ask Kat. Anyway, okay. Verify the external battery reads greater than 6.5 volts. So two, two, two. I have still eight, so I'm fine. Inspect the batteries in the she water uh, and uh, the nerd and so on. So I have to check here as well. This is good and this is good. Close the oxygen valve and verify if the pressure drops. So now I'm gonna close the oxygen tank and I don't know if you're gonna see it or not. It is funny because this is the green and the green color is removed from that movie. 
But anyway, the needle is slowly, slowly dropping down. This is because the constant mass flow. So the constant mass flow is constantly leaking small amount of the oxygen. It's more or less the amount of your metabolic rate. So you always get inside the unit, no matter what, the amount of the oxygen that you're metabolizing. This is the advantage of the MCCR part of the river. So to make sure that the orifice is not cracked, it's not stuck uh, close, or I mean, some debris just block it. You have to make sure that the needle is dropping down. It goes very slowly, but it goes down. So it means everything is fine and my CMF works correctly. Now the pressurize the oxygen line and now open the deal and button. Uh, the I open it. Okay, so breathe in any gas from the loop and verify if the ADV is functioning. So now basically I'm just breathing from my rebreather. And my ADV is not working because I had it off. Because I, I as I told you, the one thing I would improve. I, I would like to have a shut off for the ADV, which we don't have in the revolve. So I don't like ADV at all. That's why I completely shut it off. Don't do it at home. Never. Okay. <laughs> so close the loop and manually add the deal length to verify uh, the proper function of a manual addition button. So the testing that we were testing with the, with the oxygen now and testing with the deal length. Okay. It's fine. I need to not dropping. Everything is fine. Inflate, uh, inflate the loop orally until the overpressure valve activates. So now I want to make sure that my OPV is working correctly and which means I should be able to activate the OPV with my own lines. If from some reason my OPV will, let's say, be stuck close or, 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 or whatever happens that it doesn't open, I, I cannot activate it with my own breath it means it's, it's dangerous situation because if I will be ascending too fast and I will not dump the gas around my loop uh, or around my lips or the, on the nose, I may have uh, the lung overpressurization uh, issue. So I have to be able to activate the overpressure valve with my own legs. Perfect. At the same time, I close the loop when the OPV was firing, which means now there is slightly overpressure in my rebreather. I just wait a few seconds to make sure that the overpressure stays. Now, when I open the loop, I should hear the gas coming out. It's a slightly effect because the loop volume is not so big, but it's fine. Uh, okay. Now completely inflate the wing and verify it if, if it holds its volume. Okay, so I like to do it early. Nice, stays. Okay, now flash with the deal wind until the PO2 reach the PO2 of the deal wind gas. So what I like to do is my personal thing, what, what we do here, we actually validate the oxygen sensors. Remember we did the calibration of the oxygen sensor in the beginning, which means we simply told to our electronics, what you're reading now from the oxygen sensor is 1.0 PPO2 of the oxygen. If you wanna validate if that was done correctly, it, there's no other way than expose the sensor to known gas and see if the readings are correct. So. The best known gas we have is simply air. Air at ambient pressure will always have 0 0.21 or the gas in your deal wind. The problem with the, with the deal wind is if that deal wind is prime mix, and for example, now in my tank, I have 1070, so it means there is a 10% of, of the oxygen. So now if I will flash the unit with, a, with the deal wind, I should read 0 0.1 partial pressure of the oxygen. So this is the one way to do it, but it will waste my precious time with deal wind and always will not give me super accurate readings because if my blender was wrong and instead of 10, I have 12 or 11, 
I may have a problem. I will, I will be not sure if the, the, re the reason for reading 0 0.12 is because of my sensors are wrong or because of my gas is actually 12%. I analyzed it before, but I was analyzing it also using oxygen analyzer with one sensor in it. So it's not that accurate. What I like in Revo actually is if you want to expose your oxygen sensor on air, it takes literally a few seconds because I didn't do my negative pressure test. So I didn't test the final loop integrity yet. I can open it now without any consequences. And, and within a second, I can expose my oxygen sensor on air. So right now, I should read 0.21 on my electronics, and that will be the best oxygen sensor validation I could get. It takes two seconds until it flies down. Perfect. I have 0 0.21, 0 0.21, 0 0.22, which is fine. And also my NERD is 0 0.21. So I like to do it that way. So no matter what's my diluent, I always have accurate sensor validation. So I know that my sensors were correctly calibrated and they are perfectly linear, at least between 0 0.21 and 1.0 range. So now I can close it back. It takes literally a few seconds, so it's not that big hard to do it. Okay, I put the screw back here. And I did my sensor validation. So, now there's, uh, I have just three lines about my bailout tanks, so I'm gonna skip them. Uh, now, breathe in any remaining gas from the loop and perform the negative test. So now I just create a vacuum inside the rebreather. Okay, it's good to leave it for a while. Usually this is when I do my bailout. I just leave it on a negative uh, pressure test. Now I can store my regulators, prepare my bailouts, uh, analyze them if I want. I like to do this negative test for like at least uh, five to 10 minutes. Actually, I found the Revo very well negative test holder. If, if you have your O-rings really clean, lubricated, everything is fine. You can make a negative test right, right now, leave it over the night. The next morning you open the unit and you have full uh, negative pressure still hold inside the unit, which is not happening a lot from my experience in most of the other units. It's probably because there's a less connections here. We have, don't have, as I told you, no key connectors. There's only one hose on each side compared to two hoses. All those connections are additional ceiling surfaces that can fail. We will have them much less, which is a lot uh much resistance to to, to to leakage so after a while i just take my mouthpiece make sure there is a i hope you heard that so my negative test was actually really nice so then then, then bailout uh okay done now i just ensure that correct gases are programmed in my free water so i just check check my bailout is uh, actually it's 956 not 1070 then i check my bailout. Okay, I have 50, 21, 35, and 18, 18.45. So that should be fine for my dive. Good. Now turn off the sea water. Okay, clip it on the handle. Turn off the nerd. And that's it. Right now, what I did, I just fully tested every component of my Revo and I know everything was, was perfect, perfect. I can now put it on or drive to the dive site or go on a boat. And uh, the last thing I need to do, just when the unit is on my back, just before I splash, I just go over my pre-jump check to make sure my oxygen tank is open, my set points are correct and everything else is working, working correct. So that's it. That's, that's our unit build up. That's our Revo build up. Do we have any, do we have any question, Adam, questions, Adam? Nobody. Thank you very much for the for the build. Really, really enjoyed it. Very informative and lots of detail about you know the specific uh, features of the Revo that make it such an incredible rebreather. Um, I thank you very much for your time. We've 
answered most of the questions as we've gone through. Uh, there's a couple in the comments that you know you and me can go and answer uh, when we finish this presentation. Sure. But from my side, thank you for your time. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, the next rebreather we're going to do uh, is going to be the Poseidon rebreather. This time again next week. We also have the Prism Two and the Horizon coming up. So, Chevek's favourite rebreather of the, of the moment is is the Horizon. He was heavily involved in the development of that. Maybe we'll see if we can get him along um, online to help us with, help us with that build. He's certainly the, the the master of the Horizon. It's so easy that we don't need any help. <laughs> That's the plan, guys. Thank you very much for your time. We'll thank see you, you all again soon. And uh, thank you for, for, for joining us, Chemek. Goodbye, buddy. Bye-bye.